Okay, right, second part of the talk. Let's go on to that. Okay, so I'm going to talk about scaling and the hierarchy of force, and I'm going to go a little bit faster because I'm a bit, I wouldn't expect that to have taken, I'm not sure exactly when we started, within the times after seven, but it's now 10 to eight. So uh, I'm going to go relatively quickly through this bit. So if you look at different things from galaxies, solar systems, down to electrons, all length scales, the basic shape of matter seems to be of some objects bound together and rotating around one another. Just look at it. So, um, so at all different scales, you have very similar kinds of forms. So watch Arnie's talk, if you don't believe me, that's really quite striking. So, but the basis for this uni uniform, the universal dynamical structure is really a balance of forces. It's, there's a repulsive force, such as the centrifugal force. Okay, that's a, a, a moving things apart and an attractive force, gravitation. So in, in the planetary rotation, these things are very nicely balanced. And most planets go around roughly circular orbits. So astronomical sizes, the, um, the attractive force seems to be provided mostly by gravitation, at least this is what most people believe. Uh, molecular and atomic sizes, one is talking about electromagnetism. For nuclear scales, people talk about the weak and the strong interaction. But what you find is that the weakest of forces, gravitation, governs the largest structures, the least energetic structures, and the smallest structures are governed by the strongest of forces, the strong interaction, the elementary particles interaction. This is a scaling of forces, this is what one observes. So we can go from the universe, what is it? It's um, 28 billion parsecs across, 93 billion light years. Maybe. It's um, 13.7 billion light years ago, the edge of the universe apparently. So you have the universe. You can look at other scales like galaxies. Here's a picture of NGC 1300. It's lovely spiral arms. Guy, he's got lots more nice pictures in his talk. Have a look at those too. Solar system, same sort of thing, circular stuff going around and around the sun in circles, in harmonic circles. So th th there are some very nice mathematical relations between where the planets are as well. These are resonances formed over quite a lot of time. Resonant, harmonic, beautiful structures. Okay, DNA, we've got this wonderful spiral. Looks like a photon going through space, actually a double photon. So um, carbon atom. So here's a picture of a carbon atom where the electron, proton, and neutron are shown as smooth, featureless balls. So this is a sort of early um, ball model of a carbon atom, if you like, a ball model picture. Once again, though, we've got circulating stuff going around some center, like a little bit like planets around the sun. And then if we go to Mine and Martin's model of the electron, um, then we start getting into something which is a double loop going around a, going around itself. So a paper that Martin and I wrote back in 1997 explains the charge, it's about 1.6 10 to the minus coul coulombs. Not that it is, but why it is. That paper has a mathematical derivation between Planck's constant and the charge that is scale independent. So, so that topology generates a charge from the spin of the electron. The two things are related, and one can calculate the charge from the spin or vice versa, one on terms of the other. Um, it has a spin of precisely a half h bar if one starts with a photon, which one knows the spin for. So, um, it one of the big things that quantum electronics does that no other theory ever did was explain the numerical value of the gyro, of the gyromagnetic ratio. This is the ratio between the inertial between the um, uh, spin as rotating stuff and the spin as the magnetic moment of the electron. It's very nearly two, uh, it's two in the Dirac model, but actually it deviates from two. And there's a calculation in that paper as to why, not, not just what the deviation is, which you can calculate in quantum electronics, but uh, so what the value of it is, but also the why of it, why it is different physically, structurally. It um, talks about the mass, although it it explains what mass is. Mass is bottled energy. It's energy that's going around and around in circles. It explains the zeta pervading of the electron, two omega c. It explains the de Broglie wavelength of the electron, where the de Broglie stuff comes from. And if you want a good explanation of where we are with that at the moment, there's a 2019 paper on the Quisical website by Martin van der Mark. If you look for his 2019 paper, that'll go in and show you how the zeta pervading arises and how the de Broglie wavelength arises from the inner Compton wavelength of stuff that's confined within 
of light in any kind of box, box of human making or, or of its own making. And it also describes why and how the electron can have a point-like interaction despite the fact that it cannot be, that its actual size is about 10 to the minus 13 meters and not 10 to the minus 15, which is the classical radius of the electron, or 10 to the minus 18, which you measure in high energy physics scattering experiments, but it explains why you measure the, that ridiculously and unphysically small size. It can't be that small. There's another talk um, talking about some of the misconceptions also from the Quaiskill website, if you want to look into that. But it doesn't explain the scale of the mass, why the mass is what it is, and it doesn't explain what's making the light go round and round in circles, that paper. It doesn't explain why light can get confined, why and how. So to do that, we need to go further. But, um, but let's just have a look inside this thing. You see this double loop here. Here's a double loop on the surface of a torus. There's also a series of nested tori here. This is the original. Um, this is the original model, and what it's talking about is it's talking about a spinning photon spinning around inside a torus, but it's a, a, a twisting around inside a torus. So uh, that's a construction. That's a construction of an electron from a photon. So this is the belt trick. Can you see me, everybody? Good. So if we model a photon by being yeah full twist in a belt and then let that belt come round and bite its own tail and so the twist in the belt a two pi twist not not a mobius strip a full twist then one gets this object which is the looped belt now that object is the one which is shown here that's this double loop thing just here so that's just a twisted belt it's a belt with a twist in it it forms naturally the torsion in the belt is minimized by putting two loops on top of one another, at which point there's no twist. The twist of the belt is commensurate with the double looping structure, and the torsion in the belt has been relaxed by aligning the spin, of the thing going round and round in circles, with the spin internally, a bit twisting round and round. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a twist and a turn, and the two things, if you, you can align them in such a way that the torsion leaves the belt, one's left with this, minimizes field it's a very very deep minimum of energy to do something like that because a lot of fields cancel when you do that so and that's where the binding comes from so i think that's so that the, the 97 paper doesn't consider binding we did look we worked with casimir casimir was um still alive and working although he was well over retirement age when i was at phillips research labs he was working there too he heard about our stuff and came we, we worked together I'm wondering if the Casimir effect could bind electrons. Turns out it can't. I'll talk about that in a later talk too. Um, but, but what can do that is a minimization of energy by field cancellation, which I'll show you or try and or I have shown in some of the other talks which are up on Quisical. So the question of what binds it and what makes it loop, which we didn't know in 97, is now answered by an extended electromagnetism, which was 2014 work of Martin and mine. So, um, so, and the basic equation there looks very simple here. It's D mu of some, so it's a four derivative of some object is equal to zero. It looks like Max, well, it is Maxwell's equations partly. It's extended electromagnetism and is what binds it and what makes it loop in something that's not now a model, but is now a theory. It's a, a new theory of, a new relativistic quantum mechanics theory. So, and here it is, this is the new theory on a, on, a, on a slide. So in the new theory, what you have is here's the process that we talked about at the beginning. Two photons coming in, or an electron-positron pair in this configuration. Two photons coming in, one photon's going right, 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 right. The other one's going left, 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 left. They overlap in a configuration where they both have the same polarization which means they have opposite spins along the line because one's going leftwards and it's spinning around clockwise. And the other one's going rightwards and it's spinning around clockwise, which is the other direction of spin because one's going one way and the other's going the other way. So if you look at something clockwise from the back, it's going anti-clockwise. So the, this is a spin zero configuration of two right circularly polarized photons coming in represented by this looping. The electric field is green, the magnetic field is green. Here's the twist coming in. Here's the rectification of those two things into two double loops. One of them in such a way the electric field is outward directed, green out. The other one in such a way the electric field is inward directed. If you just look at the details of what's happening there, that's just what happens. That's an electron. 
that's a positron. Field in, electron, field out, positron. Two photons goes to electron, positron, electron, positron goes to two photons, reversible. Within a theory, here's the theory, d mu psi g is zero, here's its expansion, and it looks a bit complicated, and it is a bit complicated, but it's not as complicated as the competition. So this is, this is now a theory. If you just take the field part of it, so if I just take the things that correspond to electromagnetic field, which are the two component objects here, then and expand that, then you get this set of equations, and that's just all four Maxwell's equations. So this set of equations has Maxwell's equations embedded in it, but it's more than Maxwell's equations. It also has mass terms. Now, in my view, this equation is even more beautiful and even more simple than its competitor, which is the Dirac relativistic quantum mechanical equation, which looks like this. It's just what you see in Wikipedia. If you look at it, it's I d slash. That d slash is identical to this d mu, or it's isomorphic to it. it, has the same form. It's a four derivative, four vector derivative. But Dirac's put the mass in like this. He's just subtracted it as a sort of a lump of mass. And I haven't, I've put the mass in as a term like a field that's dynamical. So I've put it in in terms of um, something which has the same status as the fields, but has a mass density. Dirac's put it in as a lump of mass. This is a more sophisticated theory than Dirac's theory. Acting on a wave function, my wave function, his wave function turns out to be quite complex. It's, it's, it's on a spinor basis, spinner basis. Um, mine works on things like the field and the mass and the spin. This is the spin, this T term just here. So the terms in my equation are terms of things that are physical and in Dirac equation, they're mathematical. I think he's... I think he's made a mistake in the way that he's put the maths in. He hasn't put the maths in properly. If you put it in properly, you get this equation. So, so I think the new theory is simply Dirac as it should always have been. And that kind of begins to be proven when you start looking at solutions to this equation. And here's a solution. Now this maths may look horrible. It's actually a four component wave function, complex wave function, it has two components. This is more complex. And talking about that would take a whole talk. So I'm not going to talk very much. So this is an element of an electron wave function which has some prefactor x0 here. If you make that prefactor a pair of photon fields, photon-like fields, then it transforms this thing which has mass and field, like an electron, to this thing which has only field, like a photon. And that process is a simple multiplication process. So if an electron wave function, when faced with perpendicular electromagnetic fields, propagates them at light speed in this kind of form, which looks horrible. However, if you do the maths and you expand the terms, you find that all the mass terms cancel and you're left with exactly the textbook solution for Maxwell's equations in terms of the fields. And also with a solution to this equation, which is just the Maxwell's equations expressed in a more sophisticated mathematics, the more sophisticated mathematics which Martin and I developed in order to describe this kind of thing. So that's, in a nutshell, what some of the other talks are about. So that's the whole thing. And if you want to read about it in 20-page detail with, all the with much more of the maths in there, Journal of Physics, IOP, June of last year, up on the website, up on the high school website, of course. All that's in this are five elements. Five elements are space, time, three, three dimensions of space, one dimension of time, and square root energy density, nothing else. It's just developed from those five elements. No quarks, no electrons, the electron comes out. No general stuff for light, light comes out. Quantized light comes out. Quantized electrons come out. Quantization is not put in, quantization comes out of this theory. So you don't have to start with some quantum mechanics, you just explain what's inside quantum mechanics from a more sophisticated theory which properly does relativistic quantum mechanics. And this is the main thrust of what's happening with the Quisical Society, developing this stuff and telling it to excellent folk like yourselves. So there you go, there it is in one slide. And that's all I'm gonna say about it because to go into that maths would take a little while. So, so and I don't wanna, I, I wanna look at structure. I don't wanna look at, I don't wanna look at the maths. I'm much more interested in the structure and in the physics than in the maths. Maths is just marks on paper, and theories are just speculations. They're stuff you make up to try and describe something. The real thing is 
what it is, how it is, why it is, how it works for me. And if it doesn't work, I want to fix it. So if my car's not working, I have a lovely old 69 Lotus. If it's not working, it isn't at the moment. The next job is to engineer it so that it works when I get back to Scotland in a few weeks' time, hopefully. So and likewise with this, engineer it till it works. So I'm going to look at some of these loops. Here's a more open view of the loop. So these little aeroplane-like things have the electric field in green, magnetic field in blue, and the momentum's red. And it's just following that loop just to show how it goes round and round in circles in a double loop. Here's three views of the same object, just rotating it so you can see it. And here's exactly the same thing, but what I've done is I've put a glass torus in each case to show how these things go around a torus. Because it's glass, you see the, the refraction happening inside here of these things. See, it's a, coming up from the back, it's going around the top, it's coming around the side, it goes through the holes, and then it comes around again. That's how the flow works. I see some of you got some models up there. Don's got some models behind you. Uh, behind uh, and uh, there are various models coming up there that are similar to these things which is really cool I love that we'll talk about those in a minute so so right when I was talking about the original thing just here I'm saying there's a bunch of flows it's a non-crossing flow like that like Don's stuff and the conditions here in any electromagnetic flow in a, in a mode cavity in any physical mode cavity the, the light acts like a fluid and acts like a non-crossing fluid so this is a non-crossing flow around successive tori. The first one's just like a ring and then the tori get bigger and bigger. So I just wanted to show you a picture of an extremal torus. Here's one. So if the, if the torus gets as big as it can get, you see that, that double loop I showed you, where's my belt gone? It's not just this loop, it's all possible loops of the same length. So you can have this loop as well. It's just, and if you see, if you make, if you make the inner loop small, all the twist goes to the inner loop. It just goes bloop, through the middle of the torus. Here it is. Here, going zoop through the middle of the torus and then pretty much smoothly around the outside. Then all the twist gets concentrated. That's where the spin is, right at the core of this object. If, if you look, go to the extremal loop, but you have all possible dimensions of the glass torus for this loop. So it's all of those things. They're all non-crossing. They're all one single wavelength of the internal light. They're all the same length, those paths. They're all in harmony with one another and they're all resonant and they're all non-interfering because they reinforce one another. All the fields are in constructive interference all the way through. So this is a, this is a system which is self-recreating and it's self-binding. And it's self-binding in a way which is stronger than the strong interaction. And why do I say that? Well, first of all, experimentally, you take a high energy physics experiment at CERN and have a proton. Protons held together by the strong interaction. That's the strongest force in standard model. You take an electron, in comes the electron, whoops, a couple hundred GeV, uh, 200 times the mass energy of the proton. An energetic electron, very small, small wavelength, B is H nu, HC over lambda, comes in, hits it, badoom. What does the proton do? The proton fragments. It fragments into hundreds of particles. It forms sigmas and lambdas and higgses and all sorts of shit. Boom, what happens to the electron? Unperturbed, untouched. Bang, bounces off it. It's much stronger than a proton. The thing is indestructible at that kind of energy level. Untake a particle. Physics is not over. The, 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 there is a strong force far stronger than the strong interaction holding the electron together, effectively. Obviously, experimentally, people are blind to too many things in the 21st century. People don't think enough anymore. Thinking has been replaced by information. You look it up. Forget that, that's authority. Quisical aims to get people thinking for themselves and understanding things for themselves, not listening to some highfalutin, self-important, moronic professor somewhere. Sorry, professors. Not all professors are bad. I know some quite good ones. But nonetheless, there's an awful lot of stuff out there that is really just a lack of understanding dressed up as some mathematics. So how do you describe this kind of stuff? Well, um, that theory I just showed you is really four dimensional. It's four dimensions of space and time, but there are different configurations of space. There's a fundamental difference between a line in space and an area in space. A line is one, obviously, a line's a one dimensional, area is two dimensional. A line's in meters, an area is in meter squared. You know, these things are in different 
linearly independent spaces. And if you've got a 4D space, and you allow multiplication, there are 16 possible kinds of spaces, which are lines, planes, volumes, x times y times z, it's a box, it's a volume, it's a different thing to a plane or a line. So if you, if you add them all together, you find there are 16 of these things. There's one scalar, there's four lines, there are six planes, because there are six ways of forming a plane from four lines. There are four volumes, because there are four ways of removing one dimension out of a four-dimensional system. And there's one hypervolume, 16 in total. So if you want to do the mathematics of that, that's, that's the mathematics of this. That's the 16 components here. 16 components, three, three electric field, three magnetic field, one scalar component, three spins, that's the T thing here. Um, one, uh, four components of a vector potential, that's your A's just here. Or, a, or, or a, actually it's a kind of current vector potential, it's really a sort of mass current. So add them all together, you've got 16 of them, and that's the relation, they're not all independent because they're related by a set of coupled differential equations. So, so that they are, each one can be defined in terms of the ones up or down from it. So you can either take the whole even set, that's the, um, the, the set with either zero indices or four indices or two indices, or the odd set, which have three indices and one index, and both of those through this set of constraints of the equation define the other set. The even defines the odd and the odd defines the even. Take, take your pick, which means that only eight components are independent of one another because you have these equations if you accept the equations. So, um, but if you do, you need um, some pretty neat things to deal with this. This is an example of how to do a nine dimensional plot. This looks like three arrows at first sight. That's X, uh, what's X, Y, and Z. Um, green is X, uh, blue is Y, red is Z. So that's X, Y, Z. Uh, what are all these flattened arrows and these little, little um, fins on here? Well, they allow you to rotate the axis about itself, to have a configuration space there. And you can rotate the flattened cones independently of these. That does 9D for you. You can get 12D quite easily just by, uh, a way to get 12D here would just be to put, put a number on here to say which direction it was. Or you could put more fins on and say how the other fins were rotating or lots of ways to do this. But this is a 9D thing, which is enough to draw an electron. There's the electron drawn with these things. Not very obvious, there's actually glass in there. Can you see some of these things are deformed? So that's another double root round a torus showing how the electric field is green and the magnetic field is upward directed in this thing. That's the quantum bicycle going around a glass torus using this system. And that's quite like, that's the electron stuff that I showed you before. That's just, in fact, this is a positron because the field's outward directed. So, um, so you can draw these things. There is one thing I should say. That's a nine dimensional, uh, why is it nine dimensional? It's nine dimensional because you've got three dimensions of electric field and not four. You've got three dimensions of magnetic field at different three dimensions. Those are space, space planes, these are space time planes. You've also got three dimensions of momentum in this plot and none of the dimensions in that plot are space. It's in momentum space and field space. So, it's, so the electron is not a little donut going around in space in this thing. It's going around in momentum space. If you put it into real space, if you project it into real space, it's spherical. And four dimensional rotations are anyway you know, under different projections. If you take a four sphere, four dimensional sphere, and just project it, one, on, one and only one projection is a sphere. Pretty much everything else is kind of nested Tory. So look it up on Wikipedia or whatever in the 4D rotations. Or do the maths, easy for computers. Right, so that's stuff as a flow of electromagnetic, electromass magnetic. If we're talking about the extended theory, it's got mass in there as well. Mass density, a scalar stuff. So stuff can exist in scalar, it can exist in vector, it can exist in bivector, that's the field. It can exist in the spin, and it can exist in the quadrivector mm. in this theory, but theory is stuff you make up. So that's then subject to experiment. Now, the whole of experiment on the Maxwell's part of this, which is the six components of the field, has been around since 1870-odd, and that's pretty well established. Uh, the other stuff is new, and that has consequences. So one has to devise experiments to test this theory, but this theory is ultimately easily testable. It's analytic. It's not all hidden away. So we'll see whether or not it falls over. It might do. Probably will. We'll have to build a new one. I look forward to that. <laughs>
Okay, so what, right. Sort of jumping out of this and thinking about what people think stuff is made of. I went to CERN, I worked at CERN for seven years. I worked on implementing quantum chromodynamics in Monte Carlo programs. So quantum chromodynamics is a complicated theory. What you do to do quantum electrodynamics or quantum chromodynamics is you take the base equations. They're too, pretty much too hard to handle. You don't want to sit down and do marks on paper with a pencil with this kind of thing. Anyway, it's not going to work. It's going to take you the rest of your life. Forget about it. You stick them in a computer program, and then you get the computer program to do the calculations for you, and then you compare with the experiment. So I was partly one of the people who did that. That was one of my jobs at CERN. Um, so I know exactly what's inside these models because I've written the programs to do it, to, to implement it. Anyway, so the idea is in quantum chromodynamics, and it's also why I left CERN, because it's bullshit. Forget about it. It is not, that is an untestable theory. The reason the theory that falls over is not because it's good, it's because no experiment is capable of knocking it over, because it doesn't predict anything. And hence, one can, and hence you can't test it. All you can do is, it's sort of 50 parameter theory. So if you do an experiment on one of those parameters, they go, ah, oh yeah, we have to change one of our 50, or two, maybe two parameters. We had something that was the test that I did in my PhD. Quantum chromodynamics had a prediction for a certain quantity, an F2 structure function, that turned out to be four orders of magnitude wrong. You know, not a factor of pi, not a factor of two, four orders of, it was off the plot wrong. However, it turned out that one could get it back on the plot by changing lambda QCD, which is the strong coupling constant, like the fine structure constant, which you don't know, you make up by 5%. Yay. You change it a little bit, and it's all over the place. It'll fit a spastic hamburger, that theory. You, you, there is nothing, no experiment you can do that it won't fit in terms of quite a lot of things. That's why it doesn't fall over, because it's not subject to the, the scientific method. Because the mathematicians, the theoretical physicists, have got wise to the fact that experimentalists can knock over their theory if it predicts anything. Oh dear, let's make it a theory that can't be knocked over. Then we can have lots of fun. That's what they're doing, having fun. Anyway, so that's why I left. Because that's not a theory, it's a hole in the ground. And that's what we said to Nick Ellis. Uh, when he came in and explained to us the day after, we just disproved, we thought, quantum chromodynamics. So um, I think it was Peter Norton who said, how, you know, if that's the case, he said, tears in his eyes, crying with emotion, how can we tell QCD from a hole in the ground, he said. So the head of theory's next paper is how to tell QCD from a hole in the ground. Look it up. <laughs> anyway, you can't, so don't. So let's do it properly. Scaling and similarity. I'm just going to disprove the quark model now just for fun. I'm going to say why it's wrong. And uh, if you guys out there, you hunch to see this, well, you can come along to Quicycle in public with your name on it, and you can argue with me and see how far you get. So there's a little challenge for you. Right, scaling and similarity. So the thing is that science really scales all the way up. Electromagnetism scales from the very, very small, as far as we know, to the very, very large, to the universal scale, down to sub-nuclear scale. So you go all the way down, all the way up. So let's have a think about that. Now, what about the hierarchy of force I was talking about that dominates matter at successive length scales? As you go down and down and down in size, or up and up and up in size, you change the forces that are acting. You go from gravitation to electromagnetism, to electric, to magnetic, to weak to strong and then to super strong eventually when you're talking about what's holding the electron together which is not the strong interaction the electron doesn't feel the strong interaction so what is holding it together guys well you need a theory for that and uh, the only theory i know about is mine so if anybody's got a better one go for it so but you can understand why this has to be so quite readily a stronger force a stronger force if it exists will simply dominate over the weaker ones and satisfy itself if it can and as that force takes over and pulls things together, what it's doing is it's, is it's, is it's, um, is it's transforming to, to a potential energy, um, an energy that might exist, a kinetic energy that might exist during the process. 
So stronger forces pull things in and they lead to a tighter binding, a tighter and tighter binding within the system, releasing more energy in the process. So if you go from electron and proton and go to a hydrogen atom, what happens is um, the two things, the, the, the electron, negative charge, proton, positive charge, quantum mechanics of that puts an electron and proton at the same size, roughly 10 to the minus 10 meters, spherical harmonics, both of them beautifully spherically symmetric, outside the radius of the atom, the minus field of the electron and the plus field of the proton precisely cancel. And if you integrate that cancelled energy through all space, it's just 13.6 electron volts. So for all of these systems we've looked at, for the planetary systems, for the, uh, for the hydrogen atom that we've looked at, there's the inter there's sort of internal kinetic energy of the system that's in its internal uh, spin or its angular momentum around over the Earth around the Sun. And the virial theorem, if you've got any kind of process which, um, which, has, which is a power, a, a r to the n process, the virial the theorem, you can, it's possible to show that if the potential energy has that form, then the bound system has a kinetic energy, which is a half of the potential energy. So, uh, so, so if these things are in balance, then there's a factor of two between these two things. It's the virial theorem. So if you have a tighter and tighter binding, it means you have a low, lower and lower bare mass. The energy is going into that. So much, if not most of the mass eventually, as the forces go up, is coming from the system's internal kinetic energy, not from the bare mass of the constituents. Things are moving faster and faster as they go in. In contrast, in weakly bound systems, they have to be, otherwise they fall into nothing. In contrast, in weakly bound systems, the mass is nearly dom is dominated by the sum of the bare masses of the constituents. So if you've got a, a weakly bound system like the solar system, the mass of the solar system is pretty much just out of the mass of the sun and the planets, and there you go. So that's, that's what we think as humans to be the normal situation. And if there's a deviation from that, that implies what's commonly known as a mass defect in the hydrogen atom, that's 13.6 electron volts for the binding. So, um, so helium is another example. The sum of the mass of two protons and two neutrons is larger than the mass of the atomic nucleus, quite a lot larger. So if you go from hydrogen to 7%, uh, equals mc squared of 7% is a lot of hydrogen fusion energy, which is that process. And the deficit constitutes their binding energy, and that's the energy that comes free when they bind in the sun to produce um, 4 million years of heating and nurturing our human brains on this planet. So here we go. But this is an interesting thing which blew me away when Martin produced it. This is one of Martin's diagrams. I had. Here's a bunch of stuff plotted on a quite a large logarithmic scale. Notice mass in kilograms 10 to the minus 72, up to 10 to the plus 54. So that's quite a few orders of magnitude, it's a log scale. And size from 10 to the minus 36 meters to 10 to the 27 meters, that's the size of the universe. There we are. Mass of the universe about 10 to the 54 kilos, point there, look, click. Now let's put another few things that are interesting there, like, Andro like a, a galaxy, right, there's, there's Andromeda on that scale. Uh, here's the sun, the sun's on this thing, earth here. This, this is the mass is proportional to distance, to volume. This is m is proportional to d cubed. That's a straight line on this graph. And so for example, the human and amoeba, Mount Everest, the earth, the sun, they're all on that line. Of course, they get bigger, they get heavier, pretty much. They're all roughly the same density. So that's the density line, that's, uh, that's okay. Um, we can write, plot some other lines on this. We can plot m is proportional to scale to the minus one. This is uh, E is H nu, A is H C over lambda. One over, one over length is the energy. The smaller it gets, the more energetic. So, so quantum mechanically, or a photon, is more and more energetic. Large is small and small is large. Small size is large energy. You're winding the thing up, and as you wind it, of course the speed of light makes things smaller. It's going round and round faster and faster. So it goes round and round. If it's a big photon, it can do this. That's the speed of light over my finger there. You have to imagine that being speed of light, all right? But then as it gets smaller, it goes around faster. So, or, or its frequency goes up and its frequency is inversely proportional. Well, its frequency is directly proportional to its energy. So that's the line here. So the Planck mass is on there, but every particle you ever wanted, all photons are on this thing. That line's all the way along there. Everything from Planck, as far as we know, from Planck scale down up to a single photon which has the wavelength of the universe, whatever you like, everything, all of them fit on this scale. Protons also on that, the electrons on that, because they have an internal wavelength too. And so is the Z and W boson, for example. 
But the proton's on an interesting one. If you draw a line from the universe size and mass, and you do m is proportional to d squared, then a bunch of things appear on that line as well. A galaxy, uh, a human, and the proton. Isn't that interesting? Human's pretty much halfway up the size scale of things. There's almost as much room going down as there's room going up. <laughs> so we can kind of just in the middle. Right. But that's an interesting line, and there are some things on that line, which you might not expect, that's an area. Here's another one. This is a sort of black hole line. This is mass is proportional to the diameter. So this is the diameter. As, as a black hole gets bigger, its radius gets larger. So here's the black hole at the center of our galaxy, Sagittarius A. Look, the universe is on that, on that line too. The universe, the mathematics of the whole universe is the mathematics of a black hole. It's the point at which light just doesn't get out. You know, light just comes to a stop at the edge of the observable universe. Those two statements are the same statement. That's a black hole. We're living. If you want to know what a black hole looks like, look around you, because you're living in one. The entire universe has the maths of a black hole. So, uh, so if you think you're crushed to a singularity by being in a black hole, think again. More nonsense. I came to this conclusion quite a few years ago. Good man. Thank you. <laughs> you're so welcome. But it goes down to the Planck mass because that's how the Planck mass is defined as well. The Planck mass is not a measured. This is not. These are measured things. Most of these. That one's not. That's constructed. It's not a bad construction, uh, but uh, we don't get down to that kind of size scale and measure it. Or, or but look at how. Look where the mass comes in. It's actually quite big. The Planck mass. Um, and it has to be because it's on this black hole line. So that's an interesting plot. Um, You'll notice these things come off the line a little bit because the density of humans, roughly the density of water in Mount Everest is a bit denser, but um, not by much, of course, because this is a stupid logarithmic scale. So, so with decreasing size, the horizontal axis, there's a systematic increase in the fraction of kinetic energy, the internal dynamics, the binding energy, the energy lost at the formation as it falls into that potential well with respect to the total energy, rest mass on the vertical scale. So the stronger forces are getting balanced. How are they getting balanced? They're getting balanced at the cost of the larger part of the energy which was available initially. Consequently, at some small enough length scale, the amount of internal energy will approach the total energy of the system, and that's a limit. So, and there, no further decrease in size is possible because there's nothing to decrease it. So experimentally, the smallest stable particle in the universe is the proton. The neutron is not stable by itself, otherwise that would have the crown, only just, it's very close to the proton mass. But let, let's do some sums, let's do, let's, do some, let's do some calculations. This is not theory, this is simple calculation. Let's do some, some, so let's do the kinetic fraction of the mass energy of the hydrogen atom, for example. There we are. So here's a hydrogen atom. Um, so the electron falls in to the proton, out goes a photon, 13.6 electron volts worth. Coulomb potential, potential is minus two times the kinetic energy. And so the kinetic energy is the photon energy that's, so the, the kinetic energy of the thing here is exactly the same as the energy that's lost in the hydrogen atom. Well known, nothing surprising. First year or second year university stuff. So let's have a look at the kinetic fraction for Earth's sun. It's about 10 to the minus 14. Okay, a whole lot. Still quite a lot more than you might think. You know, 10 to the minus 14 is not. Anyway, but for hydrogen, it's 10 to the minus 8. Uh, for the deuteron, proton neutron system, it's 5, 10 to the minus 3. For the proton, it's about 0.37. It's getting close to 1. And for quarks, it is about 1. This is bad news for quarks, actually. For the, existence, the mere existence of quarks, this is seriously... You know, this, this stuff is called thinking, guys. And these are called sums, right? And, and they're not very hard sums, like they're not, well, first year university. So but here's what we think about protons. So this is a simple proton model is that you've got three quarks inside the nucleus. Proton mass is here. Charge radius is a bit less than a femtometer. Compton wavelengths 1.33 femtom, femtometers. So, which is roughly the size of this, size of this object across. So here's a lattice QCD proton. You see lattice is spelled wrongly, so I'll fix that soon. 
downport mass is measured roughly, that I think this was 2015. The thing about these quark masses is when I was at CERN, they were bigger. And as you look harder and harder, the masses get smaller and smaller. They're roughly 4.8 MeV and 2 MeV for up and down things in 2015. It probably changed a bit by now, doesn't matter. But this is a bit, I've used the word puzzling here. From experiment, we know the quarks are light. Uh, if, you, if you do deep elastic lepton scattering, which I did for three years and for my PhD, you're looking inside the proton and most of the quarks you hit are a small fraction of the, of the proton mass. Very few of them have any kind of appreciable fraction of the proton mass. So that, that means that inside them, the force that's at work is rather weak. Um, Quarks are then not at the end of the hierarchy ladder, ladder, but they come a step earlier than whatever that hierarchy is. And that hierarchy is supposedly in, to do with the gluon stuff. So, you know, there are problems with gluons. I'll come to that at some other talk, I think. So we can calculate they can only fit in the proton if they're going pretty fast. Uh, so they, that would mean a small de Broglie wavelength, which meant they fitted in small enough orbitals in a femtometer. But, what about their Compton wavelength of that? They're too light. The, the sizes that go with their Compton wavelength are far bigger than the size of a proton. They're too big. And the proton would have to be 100 times bigger to fit them in at that mass. And it's not. So it's wrong. Right? It's not possible. It, it, so experimentally, the quark partons, the things you hit in the proton, carry far too small fraction of pro, pro, proton form momentum to exist. Now, that fact, simple sums, plus the fact they've never been observed, also pretty telling. But forget about it, you know, you guys, what are you doing? So now imagine they actually are small with high masses as compared to the proton mass. Well, that would mean the QCD was, quantum chromodynamics was wrong, wouldn't it? Um, then a force must be present in that case that's stronger than the strong force with more energy involved in the binding process and even more kinetic energy to closely bind everything together. And where does that energy come from? You've already got then a fraction of 0.37 of the total proton energy is kinetic. That's also not possible. And also, as I said before, the electron is much stronger than the proton and doesn't, it doesn't even feel the strong interaction. So what's holding it together? It's a mystery. Now what this means is that science isn't over yet. We've got some work to do. So that's good news, of course. It's fun. So this suggests really there are no particles smaller than the proton that can exist independently. They, they just can't be stable. And there aren't any pro <laughs> there aren't any particles smaller than the proton that exist experimentally. You know? So you have to say goodbye to quarks. Now there are other reasons for saying goodbye to quarks, and this is Really, for me, there's, there's not an English word that's strong enough to describe this. There is a Dutch word that's strong enough to describe this. It's called bedroch. Go and look it up. Um, it is unconscionable that people are not coming out with this kind of thing. But, you know, the thing is that the quark symmetries are beautiful and they are powerful. The, the Gelman stuff is very nice. These particles do... The, the postulate that such things as quarks exist is does hold water in terms of the particles that are absorbed that are observed in groups within SU three. So so how does that work? Well, we have to think about it. Again, thinking. So you, you're pretty much forced to admit you're right at the end of the ladder when you've got to the proton. But how can we fix this? How can we save this and rescue some of the standard model? The quarks can't be independently small and heavy. At the same time, they can't be light and big. So, so what? So the only way to do it is really to string the quarks together so that they work as a unit, that the symmetry arises from a flow of a single thing that runs through the proton. Now, there are reasons for thinking that's not the case, because when you hit the proton, it does come apart. It fragments. But... Um, from the energetic point of view, and from the thinking point of view, it needs to be something like that. So um, perhaps the quarks are not coming really in granules, but they're really, and they don't have any rest mass at all, or not much, but they come together as some sort of continuum of this stuff, whatever stuff is made from, close to or at the speed of light. If so, then their orbital wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength, can become arbitrarily small, 
without the need for a granule ever having the size of it, for an individual thing to exist as a separate particle. If it's a single, single thing, which is a coherent, harmonic whole. So that's what I think has to be happening for the quark model to work. So you can look at the proton as a simple model, three quarks or lattice QCD, a bunch of quarks and gluons and C quarks. And this is what you observe, but it's really sort of floppy when you start looking at it really hard. Or um, we could go to Martin and my model of what's happening and think about this thing as being a trefoil knot that has it goes around in a continuous loop and shows the properties of quarks as properties of the dimensions of that trefoil, x, y, and z. And the whole thing running around around at light speed. So this is the constructing, so this is what I wanted to get to, what the internal structure of the proton might look like. Now I've drawn these things as simple loops. Now they're certainly not simple loops. The proton's much more massive than the electron. This thing would have roughly not far off the electron mass. And what I think is happening is something more like Don's model, where there's some complicated thing going on here, and that the, the up quark is eventually coming around as, and the reason for this, I think this has to happen because, you know what I said right at the beginning about stuff and anti-stuff? The stuff that's holding the electron together, in my theory, is the mass. The mass is changing the momentum to get the thing to go round and round in circles. Now, if the stuff holding the proton together was the same kind of stuff as the positron, in other words, anti-stuff, with opposite sign, then, then we have a problem because the proton would get eaten by the electron and vice versa, and you would have no matter, which wouldn't be convenient for life on anything. So there's a, a simple solution to this. What we're doing here is we're having a look at some things going from X to minus Y. It's going around a three quarter turn to fit this thing together. Now, the way to get a three-quarter turn, if you're only allowed to go in one sense, either left or right, is that you know, three lefts make a right. You, know, you can try this for yourself. Just try going left three times, you'll have gone right. So if you've got something which does some complicated stuff where the effect is that it goes from X to minus Y, then you have cracked it. And you can fit those things together like three-dimensional Lego to form a continuous flow, which you require to fix the problem of the size scale of these individual objects in terms of their wavelength, in terms of quantum mechanics, in terms of physics as it is known to be for photons or anything else which has a size and an energy. So then you can fix it and you can get your symmetry out as well. You can get the quark symmetry out as well, which is kind of convenient since that's what you observe in experiment without having quarks as individual objects, but they're now a three dimensional symmetry. So that's what these are some pictures of what we think the proton is. It's a trefoil knot, um, which goes around in a harmonic way in cogs and gears and forms hence a positive thing out of stuff going around in the same sense as the electron goes around with the same kind of inner stuff when they share stuff, the stuff which binds them in the stronger than the strong interaction. So let's conclude. So what do we observe? We observe a total mass of a lump of ordinary matter decreases with smaller size. But contrary to that, the mass of subatomic particles increases with smaller size. The electron is at the bottom of the mass scale. Most subatomic particles are, stable except are unstable. The only ones that are stable are the electron and the proton, and maybe the photon. Now, why do I say maybe the photon? Because photons only, as far as we know, exist in a pair, an emitter absorber pair. And because relativity puts the emission absorption event at the same point in space time at the same time. So you don't know how long the photon is because all photons <laughs> are absorbed and emitted, emitted and absorbed at the same point in space time relativistically. So it looks stable, but you don't know. So you have to know what you don't know. And it's very easy to fool yourself into thinking you know things you don't know. You're very careful with this. So We've looked at a couple of insights here about bound systems. First, decreasing size is a systematic increase of the fraction of kinetic energy and binding energy, energy lost in formation with respect to total energy. And second, that the stronger forces are getting balanced at the cost of the larger part of the, of the energy available. It's the first part of conclusions. There are three parts. So we've shown by looking at examples that the ratio of internal kinetic energy and total energy increases with the size decreases. So stable matter cannot exist at a smaller length scale than about where the internal kinetic energy and total energy are comparable magnitude. And that's the proton. 
At that point, the orbiting corpuscular granular structure with binding forces runs out of internal binding energy to hold the kinetics together. So from there, only a circulating fluid continuum thing seems in accordance with energy conservation. <laughs> energy conservation! <laughs> Moses! Consistent with experiment then and supported by theoretical, by theoretical estimates, you can infer the lower limit is given roughly by the size of the proton, and the proton is therefore the smallest stable particle, which it is. So that's, that's a happy thing. So you can pretty much rule out quarks as independent con constituents of the photon, just on quite simple energetic grounds. And so is Planck scale physics. That's even worse. And so are photons as independent particles, by the way. So given the large fraction of kinetic energy circulating inside the proton, pretty much has to be that the proton's internal dynamics is essentially a light speed energy knot. So there we are, this light speed energy, at least in part is the stuff that we are after. And it's continuous, it interacts with electromagnetism. And the nature of stuff is consistent with some topological form of some extended electromagnetism, which may or may not demand us to change our view on the structure or nature of space and time themselves and their role that they play in this kind of thing. And of course, that's the subject of some of the other talks that have been given on Quisical and the subject of investigation that we're busy with to look at the structure, not just of the electron, which I've largely concentrated on the last 30 years or so, but also the other particles. So, and that's the end of this talk. So thank you very much, gentlemen, for your attention. And I'll pass over to question and answer on this one as well. So feel free to jump in. Thank you, John. That was great. And thank you very much for your talk. It was a bit longer than I thought it was going to be, but we still got a little bit of time. But um, I'm, go for it. I have a question. Tom. Um, the neutrino has a mass two million times smaller than the uh, mass of the electron. Yeah. Why do you not consider it a stable particle? That's a good question. And in fact, well, um, You're right, it is stable. And, uh, and I think it comes into the same category as the photon though. You're right in that it has a, it is one I could put on the list of being a stable particle for that reason. It doesn't contradict the general principles I've just talked about. So in that case, I'm probably in error to say that it's just protons and electrons and that's not the photons. The neutrino is, is another one you could put in. So I agree, with you. I agree with you. The the neutrino is related very closely to the photon. Yeah, I, I think so too. But you're right. The fact that it has some sort of mass means that you have to consider it as a stable, as a stable particle. Okay. So um, so because you it's quite close to. In the model I'm talking about, you have one dimensional objects that run along a line like the photon. You have three dimensional objects which are continuous flows in, in actually a space that is four superimposed three dimensional spaces if you expand relativity to its logical conclusion. So yeah. the space in which these things run is really three dimensional or multiply yeah. three dimensional. So, um, and the neutrino is a two dimensional object in my view. So it's in between the way that mass is generated like a three dimensional box and the photon, which is really only defined by its ends, by the emission absorption. The neutrino mm -hmm. does have some of the properties of an independent particle, but um, in my mind, the jury is still out that it isn't more like the photon and that it needs mm -hmm. emission absorption to exist. It's well, it's, the neutrino is, is um, I, I've seen it referred to as a speed of light particle, yet it has mass. Yeah. So somehow it's right at that critical point between pure energy and energy that's quantized. You're, you're right, but it, it contains a quantum of spin. So it has quantization. Yes, yes, it has yes. The intrinsic handedness. The, 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 you, you have, um, I forget whether it's left handed neutrino and right handed anti neutrino or the other hand in this round, but there's only one handedness of each one. So these are quite specific kinds of objects that have a an intrinsic handedness mm -hmm. they are 
you know, the fact that there are oscillations between them is where you're getting the mass from. You're not really detecting neutrinos and looking at the process of neutrinos. One can devise other models where the thing doesn't have a mass, but does have oscillations between the neutrino types. And I think that will, I, I, I'm not saying here definitively as any kind of expert who's thought about the mathematics of these things. Um, so uh, that's for others and for later within the context of the general theory, which is still under development. But my feeling is that, um, that saying that these things have a mass because they're oscillating may be too simplistic a view of what's going on. And I think the reason people are saying the light speed is that in fact, well, the reason they're saying the light speed is because experimentally neutrino bursts associated with astronomical objects arrive at very nearly the same time as the photons. And in fact, the, mm. the masses that they have are inconsistent with that observation. Mm -hmm. I would say there's, there's a problem there and this is a problem I can't answer because um, I haven't really thought about um, this in terms of neutrinos, but I think there's a glaring problem there in terms of the mass as a mass object in terms of the speed of light compared to the mass that's measured in terms of oscillations between different neutrino types or presumed to be the case. And I think there may be a presumption too far about the nature of neutrino oscillations there that's just not really reflecting the proper nature of the two-dimensional neutrino. But I haven't really thought about that, so I don't know the answer. Work for us all to do. Good, and good question, thank you. Is there a way that we can get a copy of this um, uh, presentation? It's been recorded. It's going to be up on. It's going to be up on YouTube. <laughs> you guys, you guys are all going to be on YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube. It's well, recorded. With, that, with everybody's permission, of course. I mean, it, it, I don't know if the faces are coming up on this or not, but uh, but but the intention is to publish this. This is like a publication. Great. All right. and, and just wait for the sh wait for the reaction to come. Uh, is it on uh, Quicksycle? On Quis it will come on Quicksycle. So there it's not on Quicksycle. It's just going to be when, when it's published to um, YouTube. It will be on YouTube on 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 the Quicksycle YouTube channel. So it's independent of Quicksycle, but it's pointed to by Quicksycle. So it's available from Quicksycle. Yes. So if you go to Quicksycle, yeah, you'll find it. I have a question. I have a question regarding yep. your uh, belt demonstration. Yes, fire away. Have you, have you looked at the twist of 720 degrees instead of the 360? Yes, yes. 720, well, you can untwist 720 degrees. The, three, the 360 degrees is the fundamental thing. If you look at Don's stuff, for example, if you have a, a multiple many, many turns thing, you could yes. untwist that into a single twist, into a single knotted twist. So, so three, the thing about the electron is that 720 degrees is that, if, if you go around, where's my loop, where's my belt gone? Here we go. If you, what, what you have is you have something which, yes. you go around it once, you're actually in a different point on the belt. So going 360 degrees here, you don't go all the way around. You have to go around 720 before you finish. But, but any four pi rotation is equivalent to any other and can be deformed into it. So, um, so, so it again untwists. It twists and untwists, twists and untwists. So, so the answer is yes, and uh, it's the same as no twist at all. So John, you, you mentioned that the proton is the uh, smallest particle. Yeah. Is that inferring that the electron is larger than a proton? Much larger, a uh, thousand times larger. Yes, yes. Um, this, this, you know, it's widely believed the electron is by high energy physicists and by a lot of theoretical physicists, because this is the way you look at it in quantum electronics. So the electron is, is a point down to 10 to the minus 18 meters. Now again, by doing some simple sums and simply integrating the energy in the electric field down to 10 to the minus 18 meters, um, you get about 1,500 times the mass of the electron in just the field. The thing cannot be that small physically. And it isn't that small, it's not measured to be that small, its cross-section is much larger than that. It's, it's Compton wavelength is 10 to the minus 13 odd meters. So, and the protons is 10 to the minus 15 meters. And uh, in the hydrogen atom, both of them are 10 to the minus 10 meters. And if you look on my website, you'll find a paper where I 
published in physical review a paper showing that the electron is tens of nanometers in size in the solid state. These electrons, saying the electron has a size which is like a point is utter nonsense. It is not true experimentally and it is not true electromagnetically. It cannot be so. And where it's coming from is it's coming from theorists not understanding the difference between a point electron and a point like electron. If you look at the experiments, and a lot of them have got my name on it. And um, when you do the proper experiment, having a look at the size of these, um, of these uh, electrons, you find they are point like. Now, what that means is not that they are a point of that size, it means they act as though they're a point of that size. And that's really a very different thing and not understood by the theorists, willfully not understood, I should say, by theorists. Now I'm going to put up something which um, talking about the Casimir effect at some stage. I'm putting this up in misconceptions, but if you look in the misconceptions video, um, there's, there's me talking about why that cannot be the case. And, uh, and yes, essentially, bigger energy means smaller. Large is small and small is large. E is H nu for quantum particles. It's H C over lambda. The wavelength goes down as the energy goes up, fundamentally. And it goes down in a way that's just simply calculable. So, um, so we, you know, it's a simple equation. It's, it's also just measured. It's what you measure in a diffraction experiment. And yet people are just, uh, they get these little means, some little bit of information, and then take it as some sort of experimental fact as though it's been shown by experiment without really understanding the experiment. And this is a sickness that has to be cured by going back to doing proper science and not doing all of this stuff where everything is invisible behind a mask of quantum numbers, behind a cloak of one cannot know things because of the uncertainty relation, and that's the end of that. That just shows a lack of imagination. It doesn't, it, 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 it's only something that somebody is saying, it's not something which is real. The reality is how reality works, not what somebody says about reality. And that goes for me too. So, you know, do my sums, follow <laughs> the theory. And when, thing is, when things are rubbish, somebody has to call it out in public. And that may, that may seem obvious, but it has proven hard until now. But this is the case of the emperor's new clothes. You're not wrong. Anyway. I had a question for, uh, for Don and actually John. Gary? Don, if you, if you considered, taking your models and replacing your rope with like a ribbon that would have the kind of twist more visible? I, I did that way back at Pratt and I, I have those models stuffed somewhere around uh, where I use flat sheets of um, um, uh, tape, a paper tape that's used to glue packages together, which is good because you can glue one side <laughs> and make forms. But when you do that with, uh, you build these things with paper planes instead of rope lines, you get those effects visibly. What, what John was talking about, that, that rotation of the belt. We were lucky when we were at Phillips to have access to machine shops. So they used to be in Phillips, there used to be one on every floor. You go and had a milling machine and a lathe, and if you're the building, you go and make stuff. And, uh, and, and, and welding equipment. And so we made a lot of models in stainless steel strips. So we have models that look where you put the twist in and then the thing is um, welded together. So um, yeah, we've, uh, we've I, I, I think all of these twists make it are very important because as you're rotating and rotating, you get berry phases appearing, you get geometric phase appearing, which, which show up in a mechanical model but yeah. which sadly often do not show up in a covariant derivative invented by some theorist who just doesn't think in terms of things that actually exist and have, have torsion. So, um, so that stuff often, often gets left out. And when I first made the models I was looking at, I was very surprised. I put the sort of mathematics in of what was happening and I found the thing didn't work. Uh, and the reason it didn't work is because I wasn't putting in the berry phases in the maths. Uh, that, that, that appear naturally when you twist a belt, which is a physical belt, which is a physical strip. You have to be so careful not to fool yourself. And the way to not fool yourself is to build it 
Right? Yes. It's, it's, it's to think it, to engineer it, and then see it work. Not to just think about it, because human thinking is, you just fool yourself too easily without actually doing the thing. Which that's, is, that's what I like about your work, John. You're providing uh, models that actually explain what you're talking about. <laughs> Thank you. I hope so, because uh, otherwise it's too complicated for my tiny mind. So I have to I have to make these things work properly. Otherwise, I don't think that I don't think it's proper. I don't think it's proper anything. It's, a, it's certainly not proper engineering. It's uh, I don't think it's really proper science either, because you're doing maths. You're hiding in maths and you're lost in your own maths. I mean, people are losing themselves in their own maths. They don't understand these guys. I know them. I know some of these guys. They honestly don't understand their own maths, let alone other people's maths. They don't properly think about their own maths. And it's a tragedy. And then if you can make something which is untestable, then you never know that you're wrong. You've got to, you've got to have... It's got to be experimentally testable, otherwise you don't make proper progress. It's got to be experimentally testable, otherwise it doesn't appear in the real world as a real thing. It can't be used for thinking if it's not real. So, um, uh, this book, Lost in Math, yeah, is going right in what you're talking about, John. It's really, really well written. That's right. There's too much of it. So, look, my maths is pretty, the, the maths I'm looking at is pretty hefty, but you know, it's a struggle all the time to refine that stuff down to the one and only maths that really describes how things work. That's the solution mm -hmm. to Hilbert's sixth problem. And that's not, that's been, that was expressed by Hilbert in 1903. And the solution to that isn't there yet. This is one of the unsolved mathematical problems as to it's Hilbert's six, look it up. It's interesting. Anyway, I'm, the, the, the maths in uh, some of the other things is a possible solution to Hilbert six. And, it's a, and there's a process, the Quisical Society has a mission partly to find that mathematics of reality, that mathematics that most closely responds to what actually, to how reality actually works. We're, we're not there yet either. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's a work in progress. But as you get to better and better views of it, then that opens up more and more things that are closer and closer to what you want, which is where the new theory comes from. It comes from that process. <coughs> right, guys, uh, shall we stop? Um, I'm going to stop screen sharing and I'm going to stop recording unless there's another question anybody wants to ask, which you're very welcome to do. I just want to thank you. That, that was brilliant and thought provoking. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Roger, that's very you say. Thank you. One comment or note to make. Have you ever heard of William Kingdon Clifford's space theory of matter? Yes, I have. Oh, you know of it. Yes, I do, yes. And he cooked that up around, I guess, 1850 or something. Yeah, he didn't live long enough, that guy. He could have had a lot No, he was only made it to age 34, I believe. Well, yes, he did. And, and that algebra I just showed you is a Clifford algebra. Okay. And... So, uh, Okay, well, this is right in line with what he was writing. Oh, you're yeah, right. Yeah, no, no, he was a great thinker and, uh, and way ahead of his time. But the, the algebra is not wholly Clifford algebra. It's isomorphic to Clifford algebra, but it has an extra degree of freedom. So, okay. it's not, uh, so anyway, all of this is and referenced as in the uh, papers, which are up on quite a so, And they will be in upcoming talks as well, because there's some of the things I want to go into and develop with this project. Thank you. Well, thank you again. Appreciate it. Very right, well, well, thank you. One last question, John. Gary. Well, what happened to the hats? Oh, I just, I just, <laughs> they, they, they keep nothing. <laughs> He's wearing a virtual hat. You just can't see it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's grand unification. <laughs> I, completely, I completely forgot about the hats. I'm terribly sorry. I hope it didn't detract too much from the content. <laughs> Pretty much it was only this hat anyway.